So is it okay to drink coffee and listen to... Absolutely <laughs> good. So welcome back. We will get my voice fixed. That means uh, we will fix the microphone and make the tone a bit louder. But it will take two or three more minutes. But I think it's, it's that... on the now. Oh, it's perfect. Okay, good. Before the break, we had this horizon theorem that basically states that um, if two black holes are merging, then the area can shrink. Right? It will get bigger. Each large unit. <coughs> and then the question, of course, is natural. What about decaying a black hole? If a black hole decays, can that happen? And then the brief computation shows no, a uh, black hole cannot decay. Right? So it can't split the black hole into smaller black holes because it would violate the horizon theorem. And black holes cannot decay into a black holes of smaller masses. Then another theorem is very important, it's called the no hair theorem. It's a very strange name for the following because you can prove in gravitational uh, physics that all properties of a black hole are completely determined by its mass, by its angular momentum, and electric charge. The interesting is electric charge because there are no charged black holes. We never have. Uh, so, but if you had a charged black hole, then Charge, momentum, and mass determine all the properties of a black hole. Right? But the other physical quantities of the particles that got combined into a black hole, they had magnetic fields, uh, the spin, and so on. Right? This information is lost. Right? Because at the end, what remains is mass, angular momentum, and charge determines everything what the black hole is all about. That means there are no additional quantities, which is called hair, the Wheeler, the hair, is irrelevant for black holes. And this is then the black hole theorem, right? Black holes have no hair because only these three quantities, uh, so cosmic censorship, black holes have no hair, and so on, right? But so these three quantities determine what the black hole is. But again, all particles that collapse into a black hole have these other quantities, this information. What happens to it? Right. What happened to this information, which is in a few slides, I will come back to it. Now we are moving back again to computer science information. So the first observation, very important, is vacuum fluctuation. What the hell does that mean? If you have Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, in typically in the lecture, we learn here uh, A and B are observables, right? The precision which you can measure the observables is, is all, always greater than this term here. This is the commutator. Um, certain expressions, certain specialization is that the, uh, en the energy times, uh, the, times the time is greater than h squared over 2. And that means for a short period of time, because so e is equals mc squared, that is what we all know, that means for a small period of time, the mass is indetermined, right? You can, mass, is, mass can be created. Right? Out of nothing, mass can be created for a small period of time. And this is what basically happens under conservation. So conservation physics says that the matter must consist of particles and antiparticles. And after this small period of time, delta t is over, they combine again. Right? They annihilate. Annihilation. Well, the conception is that these vacuum pairs are created permanently right? in, in, our, in our world. Permanent particles are created for a small period of time and then get back again. This is what we call uh, vacuum fluctuation, right? It is, uh, everything happens, uh, there is no space without anything. Particles are created, are annihilated, but right? that's constantly happening. Oh, and this basically has an impact on black holes. 
because this means that black holes do evaporate. Why the hell is this the case? So if you are close to the event horizon, an event happens, namely a particle T and its antiparticle T bar is created. It's, let's assume that T bar is closer than T to the black hole, that means T bar is sucked into the black hole, but T does escape. Then no annihilation is no longer possible. This would be a violation of conservation of energy, right? which must not happen. So that, then if you take a look to the math and analyze it, you, it turns out that the energy of one of the particles is negative. Right? Because the negative energy plus positive energy, which are the same, is zero again. That means if T bar in this case has negative energy, it has a negative mass. Right? Because C squared is positive, M times um, M must be negative. That means if a particle falls into the black hole, negative mass is falling to the black hole and the mass of the black hole is reduced a little bit. Right? That basically means the black hole is evaporating. Although it's <coughs> such a very powerful thing, but this gravitation, it sucks everything inside. No, nothing can get out, it will at the end evaporate. But it takes a long time. <laughs> so it takes 10 to the power of 67 for a black hole to evaporate, while the age of the universe is 10 to the power of 10. <laughs> it means it takes a long time, it plays no role. Evaporation of black hole these days plays no role at all. But Astrophysicist thinks it, had, it was very relevant at the very first few seconds of the universe. Right? Because that, uh, you can show that at this time also black holes have been created, micro black holes, prime audio black holes, very small, and they evaporated very fast. Right? So prime audio black holes, very nice name. Now we dive a little bit deeper into information. So black holes can evaporate. How about? Black hole loses mass. Does it at some point in time lose also the, the, the uh, property of being a black hole? We come to that. Okay. Compass. I need to write I introduce now the term macro state and micro state. So let's assume the system has uh, n particles. Then you must distinguish between the micro state, that means the state each individual particle is in in the macro state that is the resulting overall state of the system. Right? And so macro state result from micro states, we all know this from gas for example. The micro, macro state of a gas, its temperature, its pressure, results from the micro state of the moving atoms in the, in the gas. That means from the location, the momentum and so on. This is what I think you learned still in still, still school, gas line, the gas, gas equation. And then we introduce the term phase space, it's a set of possible microstates that you basically have. And then assume that PI is the probability that the ice particle has a certain microstate. What you then have is a configuration, it's a, it's a probability distribution of microstates that result in a macrostate. Terminology. And then the information that you need to determine the configuration the overall macrostate out of the microstate is called entropy. So entropy is the information that you need in order to determine the macrostate out of microstate. And this is the formula that most or many of you know, but this is the formula of uh, entropy. And in thermodynamics, it has a different motivation in thermodynamics. You can prove that the entropy follows this equation, and that means it's a very fundamental theorem in physics, second law of thermodynamics, that entropy cannot shrink. It can always go, grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger, which will become very important. So in quantum physics, a microstate of a particle I is mapped to uh, uh, cat I in the Hilbert space. It means the phase space is a huge Hilbert space, and the corresponding microstate is the density matrix. It is made up of the microstates. And then you know that for Neumann entropy, it's this formula, right? Trace rho times uh, ln rho. So the quantum physics entropy corresponds to up to the factor of this uh, Boltzmann constant to the information theoretical entropy. So it's the same terminology up to a factor. So summary, entropy measures the information needed to completely describe the microstate out of the microstate that makes up the, mic the uh, macro state. 
and entropy can never decrease. And very interesting, entropy, uh, things that have entropy have temperature. This is what I had before. I'm skipping over it too fast again. <coughs> oh, sorry. Because the entropy, the change in the entropy is the change in the amount of heat, Wärmemenge, and T is the temperature. So if you have <coughs> some entropy, right, everything that has entropy has temperature. Which will become important, so uh, everything has, has temperature. Because there is another formula, Wittgenstein walking. So a body, let's assume that the body of mass M and entropy S falls into a black hole. What happens is the entropy outside of the, horizon, of the horizon is reduced because the thing with the entropy is sucked into the black hole, the entropy is away. But this is a violation because entropy cannot decrease, it must increase. So what that basically means that the mass, because mass falls into the black hole, right, the mass increases, that means the Schwarzschild radius and thus the surface area of the black hole increased. So because entropy cannot increase, otherwise entropy, uh, the otherwise lost entropy must somehow correspond to a little piece of surface that is used to increase the event horizon. So that basically means the horizon area is a measure of the entropy of the black hole. The more mass with entropy falls into the black hole, the bigger gets the surface area, it means the surface area is a measure of the information content in the black hole, the microstates of the black hole. There's a very famous formula, this is the Wittgenstein walking formula, and here's the area of the Schwarzschild <coughs> sphere, but this is the entropy. And here we have some thing LP, LP is the Planck length. Right? Planck length is the smallest length in which space can be subdivided. Everything smaller than LP collapses into a black hole. I'm not going to prove that. This is <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So, um, as I said before, things with entropy have temperature. Now, the temperature of a black hole, according to the formula on the other slide, this is here the temperature of the black hole. Especially, the temperature is proportional to one divided by m, the mass, and a body that has temperature is radiating, thermal radiation, Planck radiation. Yeah? Um, that means a red black hole radiates, which is a contradiction because nothing can escape a black hole. Radiation are photons. It's a, it's a contradiction for the time being. But the solution is this radiation, this thermal radiation, corresponds to the particles that are created when the black hole evaporates. When a pair of particles is created close to a black hole, one is sucked into the black hole, the other uh, goes, goes away. This is now interpreted as the radiation that the black hole has. Right. So by radiating, the black hole is losing mass, and when the mass is reduced, the temperature is, in is increasing, and at the end, the black hole gets so hot, it will explode. We didn't observe that yet, yeah? Just that if you want to make a comment a little bit on how yeah. is this not already violating the law here? Why do you think it's violating? Well, like because at the temperature? No, no, because it has entropy, and entropy means it has no internal states. <coughs> so that it has no internal states except for uh, mass, uh, charge. Yeah, I, I, I cannot learn anything about the internal state. I can only measure the entropy. can measure the entropy, it's proportional to the surface area, but I don't learn anything about the internal state. So it's okay for you to have internal states yep. yes. other than those three, as long as they're inaccessible? Absolutely, it's inaccessible. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now comes up and something absolutely uh, weird. The holographic principle by Torf von Saskind. Torf is a Dutch Nobel Prize winner. Uh, so the information content of a black hole is proportional to the number of potential microstates in the black hole. Yeah? Every, it's not accessible, but we have microstates in the black hole. Right? And these microstates, they are scattered around the volume of the black hole, right? because the particles 
were scattered across the volume of the black hole. But interestingly, we saw before that the entropy is only proportional to this two-dimensional thing, the surface area. What does that mean? But well, you can then show that via entanglement, the degrees of freedom within the black hole becomes proportional to the enclosing surface. Can we see first the particles in the black hole? They are entangled, they lose freedoms because they are very closely coupled. That means the number of degrees of freedom is reduced to the surface area. And that basically means the degrees of freedom of the microstores within the black hole in three dimensional space is in one one correspondence to freedom on the horizon, which is called the holographic principle. It's like a holography. Holography is a two dimensional picture. If you shed light through it, laser light through it, you see three dimensional stuff. This is the holographic principle. That means we have here a new phenomenon that all the knowledge of some, something three dimensional is represented on a surface only. And the really weird thing is that you can prove that that this as well, so the horizon is like a hologram of the inner of a black hole. And you can also show as well, all information about the inner of a black hole is encoded on the horizon. Here's now the next figure. This is again the formula. S equals blah, blah, blah. So the entropy is the number of Planck cells. Here's the horizon area. This is uh, L square, the Planck. The area of a, of a Planck is called the Planck cell. So the number of Planck cells that make up the horizon is a measure of the entropy, of the end of the information. And the uh, perception that quantum physicists have that the information that is contained in a Planck cell is exactly one qubit. And the figure is like this. You have the surface area, the event horizon. The event horizon is triangulated into here in triangle for the surprise. And this is this, uh, the area of this triangle is the, is the uh, Planck uh, <coughs> square. And within that, you have qubits. No one in hell knows what, what is the qubit made of. So this is theory, right? You can't prove it. Yeah, the, but the, the most astrophysicist said, OK, this is the information content. We divide the surface in Planck cell. And each Planck cell contains a qubit, a piece of, piece of, in, uh, piece of information. That means information equates surface. And the damn interesting thing is that you can show the same for the whole <coughs> universe. The whole universe is nothing but a manifold. Right? A manifold has some surface area. And all that can happen in the universe is reflected holographically on the surface of the universe. And this results in a nice statement called it from qubit. All the universe is created, described by the information content of the qubit that make up the surface of the universe. We will come to that a little bit later. So it from qubit means everything is information. And some physicists, especially the quantum uh, gravitational physicists, believe that information is the most fundamental thing. We will see that in a few slides, space is no longer fundamental, what Newton and others saw. Space is made up of information. If we walk, we kick around qubits here, right? So, Quantum physics is more uh, fundamental than we all thought. Is there any intuition why the information horizon, the event horizon is modeled by triangles? No, you can say hexagons, blah, 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 but you must keep in L squared. Right? Absolutely. <coughs> so, information, this was again the entropy formula as is proportional to the surface area. Event horizon is just as big to fix the information content of all the matter that has fallen into the black hole to represent it at the, at the horizon. And the information content, the entropy, determines the Schwarzschild radius. And because and, and, uh, even the gravitation of the black hole is determined by the Schwarzschild radius, thus by the entropy. So everything that makes up a black hole and this great hand, it sounds like a contradiction to black hair. Theory, right? But this is mathematical games that you play here, right? You reduce everything to entropy. So the interpretation is entropy and thus information content of the black hole determines the curvature of space time close to the black hole, right? Because the curvature formula was in entropy. 
Gravity does not exist as, macro, as macroscopic scales, so this, the term gravity doesn't make any sense if you take a, a piece of the space that is smaller than the Planck length. Right? All the physics, gravitation physics breaks down. And gravity is a macroscopic effect of entropy that means of information. Gravity is information. So computer science is gravitational physics. <laughs> so, and space-time consists of small structures because of the Planck cells. Each Planck cell carries one kilo of information. And the qubits of Planck cells are entangled in order to reduce the degree of freedom in the inner of the black hole, to reduce it to the surface area. The qubits are all, all entangled also. And what then the consequence is that space-time is emerging. That means space-time is a phenomenon of emergence, no longer fundamental. Very fascinating books. I, I have all the, all the papers and books uh, cited on the, the top of the slide you see it. That means space time is a fabric, the Weber is a fabric that emerges from entangling qubits that are within the Planck cells. It's just fundamentally, philosophically thrilling that the space that was at Newton the most fundamental thing is in the meantime understood to be something that is not fundamental. It is created out of entangling qubits. Absolutely crazy. My guys are laughing because they know that I'm crazy. <laughs> so, uh, absolutely fascinating. Yeah? And nobody knows what these qubits are made of. This is a novel miracle of course. Somebody must find out what these qubits are really made of. Um, this means it from qubits. Frank, you said surface is two-dimensional, space-time is four-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole, the whole <coughs> principle shows that gravitational theory in n-dimensional space is exactly one one corresponding to quantum physics in n minus one dimension. That means the surface of a four-dimensional manifold is a three-dimensional manifold. Yeah. It's holographic. Okay. And your holography creates one additional dimension. And in string theory, they, they talk completely about different. Nine, 25 uh, dimensions. Uh, yeah. Completely nine, different. Right. Yeah, different. Does it have any effect on... on uh, yes, because even string theory and other theories contributed to the insights that I'm presenting you. Mm -hmm. But this is far beyond my horizon. I don't understand that. Can you go back one slide? Yes. Sorry. Do you see stop? Yeah, just show the whole slide for more. Next one? No, no, there was 60. So slide 60. Slide ah. 60. For just, just show it for a second. 60. This thing? 60. 60. Slide 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. 60. <laughs> I understood something different. <laughs> <laughs> just a second, just a second. Okay. One more. <laughs> now this is PowerPoint and Keynote are different. But this is easy. So. I don't know. Do you have a slide, huh? <laughs> 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 you will get the handouts. You will get the handouts, Daniela. Huh? You will get the handouts. Yeah, but I want to understand it now to keep on thinking with your talk. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Space-time is not fundamental. 
why don't people kind of, let's say, be more panicked and question a lot of Einstein's things? Uh, people do. There's a small community. There's yeah, a series of series of conference. The co series of conference is named it from Qubit already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they started with six people, then 18 people, and last year they had 18 people. Yeah. So the community is growing. Yeah. Right? But this, this is actually the video I sent you. Ah, okay. Good. Ah, the Hoffman. Uh, but you see, I'm, yeah. I'm thrilled already. Once yeah, you read it, you are uh, seductive. Okay. I jump over this for interest of time because it's no, so, no, 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 no. So, ER <coughs> equals EPR. So, the concept of a wormhole. It's a construct that has been introduced by Hermann Weyer, and it's a special solution of Einstein's field equation. And the idea is space-time consists of two copies, so to speak, two sheets, right? And the sheets are connected by a cylinder. So what does it mean, right? Here you have space-time, here you have the other part of the space-time, and here you have an event horizon, here shown as a circle, here's another event horizon, here is a cylinder that connects the two event horizons. Right? Mathematics is blah 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 blah, three-dimensional topology, right? you can describe it more, but, but this figure should suffice. And the more nice figure from the internet is this thing. Right? You have space-time, space-time is not flat, but you have space-time, it is somehow curved, right? And here is a black hole, here is a black hole, and between the black hole there is this, this warm hole. So this is here billions of light years, and this is only a small, a few micrometers. Right? So this is a warm hole, and uh, does a warm hole uh, exist? So the first indicator is, this is what, what is done in gravitational physics. We have two warm holes. They are not connected here, right? <coughs> Two wormholes, you have a particle in one wormhole, and then they describe an experiment, some measurement at the horizon of the wormhole, and the information of the measurement is sent to another black hole, and they define a quantum physical process so that this particle can be recreated here. So it sounds like teleportation that we all know. And the quantum physicist interpretation was, let's take Hermann Miles' idea of a wormhole, that there is a wormhole between the black holes, so that the particle moves from this end, so from the A end to the B end. Right? This was the first indicator of what that basically means. This is similar to teleportation, and there are papers that compare teleportation with this uh, uh, process. So wormholes. But wormhole and entanglement, teleportation is all about entanglement, that you share entangled state, then a lot of papers show that if you describe physical effects via wormholes in gravitational theory, or you describe it via quantum physics in the entanglement, you always get the same result. Or if gravitational physicists say this is true, then quantum physicists come and prove that based on quantum mechanics. They prove the very same, and vice versa. So both theories seem to be, to a large extent, producing the same results. And the other indicator is, assume you have two QPUs, QPU1, QPU2, and they you entangle the states of the two QPUs. And then if you, if you tr uh, transfer information from QPU1 to QPU2, right, QPU2 can learn something about QPU1. Or that means at the two end of the warm hole, one can learn about the one end of the wall of this uh, black hole. And that means again, computation with gravitational theory, that means wormholes, and computation with quantum protocols in your entanglement, is not the same results. Right? There are tons of papers that show that how, how, how to do that. And this is now taught by uh, Zaskind, is in, uh, in uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, ER equals EPR. <laughs> this is marketing, great marketing. Because at the very same year, Einstein wrote a paper with Rosen called The Particle Problem in General Theory of Relativity, where he introduced wormholes. So, wormholes, although Hermann Weyl theoretically introduced it, Einstein wrote this paper. You can download it, it's fascinating. You read it, it's easy to read. Right? It said, plus, and now we know 
the space-time is connected full of volumes. And in the very same year, he wrote with Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, came quantum mechanics with Fibra, he invented entanglement. Right? Two fundamental papers, one gravity, one holes, one entanglement, in the same year, and Einstein did not see, but we might hear later, that entanglement and wormholes are the same phenomenon. And both have been invented by Einstein. This is also, this is called ER, Einstein Rosen, equals EPR, Einstein Podolsky Rosen. This is a very nice formula. E ER equals EPR. It means wormhole and entanglement are the same phenomenon. This is here the seminal paper by Malasina and Saskin, and so on. Uh, they describe that. And the consequence is entanglement between particles origin from wormholes. You can read it here in this paper, right? How they are from 2014. And you, there are even experiments how to generate wormholes in principle, right? Nobody did it. But in principle, even the following, you create tons of bell pairs with bell states, right? Then you separate the bell states far apart, and then you basically collapse. <laughs> This part into a black hole and this part of a black hole, and what remains is the entanglement between the black holes, which is equivalent to a warm hole between the uh, black holes. Uh, Hawking radiation warm holes, so what that basically is, so uh, the two ends of a warm hole are called the mouths of a warm hole, right? This, is, this black hole is the western mouth, this is the eastern mouth, mouth of a warm hole, and if a black hole evaporates and particles are coming out of the, seemingly coming out of the black hole, they keep entangled with their counterparts within the black hole. Uh, and so that means you have very small warm holes here. This is a very small, uh, second, uh, second very small warm hole. And at some point in time, the particles that evaporated out of the black hole are contracted again into bigger uh, into, a, into a, a black hole so that you then have a bigger warm hole between and the time you can even compute the time with this happening a couple of million years it's called a page time right you can compute that how long it takes so and then in science fiction you fly through a warm hole from one end to the other tough luck this is wrong right? uh, because a wormhole is growing faster than matter that tries to move through a wormhole. In order to understand this, it's absolutely crazy. It's complexity theory. Because the state of a black hole, a quantum state, can be measured in terms of complexity. What is the circuit that you need to run in order to describe, to create the quantum physical state? And this is an exponential <laughs> Circuit. And now Saskit and others explain a lot with complexity theory uh, about traversability, about structure of black holes. So here, the quantum information theory and complexity theory come and explain gravitational physics. Well, this is only, only a teaser. I'm not diving deeper into it, but, but, but okay. Um, but you can meet in the, in, the, in the middle. So you can jump into the black hole. You know, to meet your friend, he jumps out also into a black hole, you, you uh, always meet him in the middle. You can't get out again, so it would be an interesting discussion what you do that, right? But some you are then trapped in the middle of, uh, between the two black holes. But microscopic wormholes could be traversable, and you can submit information, right? And this is uh, an experiment. Can you create traversable micro black holes? Because based on the holographic principle that I showed before, is the dynamic of quantum system is the same as quantum gravity. That means there's an indicator that with quantum computers you can run experiment on quantum gravity. I have a question to the last slide with the traversability. If it curves so fast, so uh, how can they meet? So. Because uh, the, if it grows so fast, you always... Uh it does not grow faster than light. So if you, are, if you jump inside stuff, so it's a lot of stuff. How fast do you, if you jump into a black hole, how fast will you get? At the end, you will get as fast as, as light. And then, of course, you are torn apart. 
So it grows faster than you throw information in, and then the black hole is basically growing because the complexity of the circuit construct your, your quantum state and merge it with the quantum state in the in the wormhole is expanded, it grows faster, it grows, it grows, it grows, but you can't go th uh, grow through it because yeah, of com it's complexity theory. But the question was if you have uh, you have the same problem from both sides. Absolutely. Right? So yes. how can you meet? Because at the end you meet in the middle. You, you get slower and slower and slower. Both travel with the speed of light, and then they meet in the middle. But you can't go beyond that. But I thought inside uh, black holes there is no space time. So, no, no space. Did no I say that? No, no, space, 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 right? no there is space time. Who knows? Um, people say. No, you said there is no. I said no. Why did you say no? <laughs> Nobody knows. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, but you said you, you can meet in the middle, which means you have to travel somehow. But uh, if I'm right, there is no space, no time. There is no traveling. That's not and, and I told you a couple of slides before there is no space time because it's an immersion phenomenon of information. Then you cannot talk about moving. There is no movement if there is no space time. It's you can describe the movement in changing of information. Yeah. Okay. It's a complete new physical theory. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the fireball. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's another phenomenon I didn't want to touch that because of my own side. Uh, where are we now? Uh, ah, so. Uh, that means because you have. Uh, um, this holographic quality, quantum and gravitation is equivalent in terms, right? What you do is you can prove ER equals EPR, and this is what has been done very fast uh, in a Google experiment. Right? It's two papers, each about 50 pages long, right? Very thrilling. I don't dive in, in, into the details. What they do is they have special kind of circuits running in QPU1 and QPU2. And they prove that information content out of here can move over there. And the interpretation, according to the holographic principle, is that they created a micro wormhole, two micro black holes with a micro wormhole, and micro wormholes are traversable. But right? this is the only information they discuss it with physicists and so on. Do I have the links or do I have it on the other slide? Here are the, so this is the paper from last year, end of last year, the Google team, and they blog, the blog is very lively, people commenting, you can read how they argue here, right? This is uh, how to interpret the quantum circuits that they're basically around. But from this time on, uh, you cannot only simulate quantum uh, quantum physical systems on a quantum QPU, but also gravitational systems. Black holes, warm holes can be simulated, which is thrilling for quantum physics, uh, for gravitational physicists, because now they can do, somebody asked, can they do experiments? This is what quantum, but so this this is how they do the experiment. They say, okay, I can. This is the first time how I can use quantum quantum computers to simulate black holes, warm holes, and so on. So this is one minute summary. <laughs> what I described is I described Einstein field equation. They described the inner geometry of space time. I tried to emphasize. I know that I'm not successful in two minutes. Uh, we distinguish between outer geometry, geometry of a surface that is imposed by the space for the surrounding space. This is well known until Riemann. And Riemann has basically shown there's also inner geometry. You can define, you can measure all the geometrical properties of a surface, the manifold, without considering the outer space. Um, and black holes are solutions of these kind of equations. I've shown you two solutions. There are other solutions for how black holes may, may look like. Uh, black holes are confirmed by observation. I've shown you some figures. You asked what the mechanical quantum mean and so on. Black holes have fundamental properties. I presented a couple of theorems the horizon theorem, no hair theorem, Hawking radiation. We discovered that entropy is proportional to the area of the event horizon, which resulted in the holographic principle. Uh, warm holes are special solutions of Einstein's field equation and can be described as entanglement between black holes. Uh, NIST computers can be used these days to uh, enable experiments about quantum gravity. And this results in a deep understanding of entanglement based on ER equals EPR. And the most thrilling thing is, and Sharon shares my thrilling, space-time is emerging. It's from cubic. So all that we have 
is information. That's a valid viewpoint that nothing else exists than information, and it's an emergent phenomenon of quantum information. And now we have a lot of <laughs> Join lunch, and I think there are some questions left. Please don't just go away. We we'll have a picture ah. taken, so we have got a nice picture of all the people who are here this year for the website. And the second uh, administrative point for all those who brought the poster for the poster session: I know. please get your posters, give them to Felix until Wednesday, so he can put them up for the session. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Do we have questions, or should we continue afterwards or during? Ah, okay. Good. Doesn't that violate the horizon theory? If you have a micro hole from outside and one inside. And they are entangled, then you can observe the other one and get information from the other one. I told you, but wait. <laughs> I try to save time now to think. Yeah. Uh, Do you think that it violates the horizon theorem says that the area cannot shrink? How is it not? Then whatever horizon, yeah. maybe it's not the right theorem. Does it not give me information about the inside of the black hole and I will go more piercing the event horizon? Yeah, but you can't learn anything about the inside. If I observe the outside, can you I You don't see? know what the inside is. You're Are they they are entangled. Yeah, but you can't learn what's happening. It's a single <coughs> piece, so to speak. Because they are the same. So two entangled particles are, it is in fact, a single particle. Two entangled particles behave as a single one. The outer part I can observe. So you mean if you measure it and so on, I learn about the inner part? Yes, I don't know the outer part. Oh my God. Very simple. I, uh, it's good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Can you use that as a communication media? Can you use that as a communication media? Communication media. Network. Uh, you, so what does it mean? You want to communicate from one end of the universe to the other universe? Yes. Yeah, there are theories that, that try to describe that. <coughs> so I saw papers that describe that. It's very small. And my, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, what I said, yes, there are papers. There are papers, right? Um, in, I, 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 can, I can, so I, I upload the slides, and tomorrow you and I sit down and I show you. What is the book when you read? Yeah, I can't read all the books in the end. Ah, okay. <laughs>